Hello everybody. In light of our looming decolonization of global health conference that's taking place on the 24th of April, and please do join us, we're really looking forward to it. Lois King and myself, Ines Hassan, from the Global Health Departments at the University of Edinburgh, will be discussing what this growing global movement means to us personally. So first of all, what do we mean by the decolonization of global health? Um, so there isn't one particular definition that everybody agrees on, but everybody who works in this space is aware that its history is rooted in tropical medicine and links to the old Western empires. So this idea of saving those in the global south, but also preventing these weird and tropical diseases from affecting those of us living in the West. For me, the first time I actually thought about these problematic practices was when I started doing some work for an international um, global health organization and their local partners in Ghana. The relationship was set up in such a way that the Ghanaian partners would forever have to be reliant on this international group because they couldn't be trusted with long-term funds. And it just made me feel there is something fundamentally very wrong with this setup and actually just made me feel very uncomfortable. Um, and since I've become a student of global health, this feeling um, hasn't gone away. I still feel uncomfortable about global health. Um, and I think much of it is rooted in um, this, these old colonial practices. Um, so what about you, Lois? When did you start thinking about some of these things and what does the decolonization of global health mean to you? Mm. Yes, yeah, so I think my sort of understanding of it has evolved over time through lots of Dif being in different situations and being uncomfortable in different situations so you know from things ranging to the poor poor <laughs> such lack of diversity in my undergrad years especially to student groups coming up to us and trying to convince us to pay thousands of pounds to go volunteer and help children at an orphanage in Africa <laughs> which is basically voluntourism um, there were lots of little scenarios that I just, that just didn't sit well with me. And quite recently, um, it's quite interesting, as a family, we've been um, thinking about how it was we came to the UK in the first place. So my mum coming from Ghana to uh, work as an anaesthetist in the UK, that was facilitated by a, a white man and he was a consultant at a hospital in England. But he was also involved in a lot of charity work where he would send medical staff and medical supplies to different countries in Africa. And we'd always seen him as very benevolent and, you know, it's great that people are doing these things. But more recently, we started to see that it had actually been more of an ego stroking um, practice. And there was still a huge white savior complex thing going on. So it's interesting how we tend to talk about problematic practices of the past, but we hardly ever talk about the structures that are still in place. And, you know, people like this man that use these structures to his own personal gain, even though he was doing some good. What are the things that we can do practically to address these structural barriers and um, even ourselves to check our own privileges? Because when we're part of institutions, that also uphold these structures, we need to hold ourselves to account to. So yeah, that was when um, I started discussing this with you and then this whole Edinburgh decolonizing global health movement started to form. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to the conference happening on the 24th. Me too, me too. Thank you very much. Um, and if any of you um, uh, have thoughts on what the decolonization of global health um, means to you um, and um, ideas about what we can do about it, please leave your comments below. Thank you, Lois, again. Thank you.